So, hi, my name is Marson. Uh, I'm here with uh, Dr. Ed Kim and Dr. Mike Sue. We're going to be performing Y90 uh, segmentectomy. So our history is we have a 68-year-old male, with a three centimeter segment six hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, newly diagnosed in April. He has a past medical history of diabetes, hypertension, is a past smoker. His relevant labs include albumin of 3.4, total bilia of 0 0.5, INR of 1.1, platelets of 141, AFP of 2.9. Next slide. MRI with contrast shows an arterially enhancing mass in the liver with washout. Next slide. So to summarize, 68-year-old male with 3 centimeter segment 6 HCC. He's ECOG performance class 0. Is a BCLCA tumor, child's pew cirrhosis A. Uh, therapeutic options for him include surgical resection, transplant, ablation, and Y90 radioembolization. Next slide. On May 9th, he underwent mapping with MAA injection. Celiac and subselective arteriograms show uh, an enhancing mass in the right lobe with a somewhat complex vascular supply. Next slide. And cone beam CT again shows this vascular supply. Two separate cone beam injections are uh, fused together on the image on the right, one in red, one in blue, showing uh, together uh, that these uh, encompass the lesion. So we use a, um, a Merit medical um, sheath to get in, five French, and we did that using ultrasound. You put a cocktail in, and then we use the ultimate three, also made by Merit, and in this case, it's advantageous for us to use this. It's a five French catheter. It has a 125 centimeter length. It has a kind of like a, I guess, the typical catheter shape that we use, which is like an L shape with a, with a hook at the end to get into the celiac artery. And in this case, it's advantageous because our patient is about six foot two. And so length uh, in these situations with taller individuals is, is uh, something that we have to plan for. And so with the 125 centimeter length, you can see that we have uh, a decent amount of length outside the patient's wrist that we can work with. And so we're comfortably within the origin of the celiac uh, with room to spare in terms of the base catheter. We also use the Flow 30 instead of uh, what other companies make, which is like a Y adapter. And that's because, it, again, it saves us length in terms of uh, getting to our target vessel because we're going very subselective. And then in addition, we have a direction that we're using, an 021 direction. It's 2.4 French at the distal tip of it. And this also gives us uh, a little bit more length in terms of our microcatheter work. It's 155 centimeters in length. And so uh, I'll show you the images in a sec. Length in this issue in the six foot two patient was not uh, a problem. And so we had room to spare both with the uh, base catheter and the microcatheter along with getting down. So, uh, we'll show you our images. So if you can show actually the first uh, fluoroscopy, save Debbie, you'll see us navigating down the uh, thoracic aorta. It was actually quite uh, smooth. And so. And this is the 125 ultimate catheter, right? This is ultimate the 125 three. ultimate three, Aaron. The ultimate three. Right, there's four, four shapes. And so we got into the origin of the celiac. Uh, nothing um, particularly unusual about this. Pretty standard anatomy. But you can see the, uh, the large HCC tumor blush uh, in, in the, the right lobe of the liver. And so we actually were a little impatient. We're going to do three separate injections here, and, the, and I'll, I'll explain why. But we already did the first injection. So if you go to the next run, please. And again, you can see that we went out pretty selective into uh, one of the branches with plenty of uh, microcatheter to spare. And the cone beam CT that Marcin showed you earlier, we fused the images together because we knew a uh, number, there were a variety of factors in play here. There was multi-vessel supply to this tumor. It wasn't just an end vessel. And typically we see this in segment five, six. Uh, but also his breathing, if you see the origin of the vessel, uh, the catheter when we were doing the mapping would go back and forth. And so for me, I felt more comfortable uh, going distal and doing three separate injections. And so this is the first injection that we did in one of the feeders. And then if you go to the next injection, and this is our second injection. And you can see that there's almost three feeders coming off of this, but we felt comfortable seating our microcatheter in this place. Uh, and you can see that there is an incomplete picture on the 2D angiography, and this was all confirmed on cone beam CT. You know, so patient's height does, does come into play, and, and, and we want to stay as, as distal on the wrist as we can. And we don't really want to creep up in these tall patients because uh, it does increase the risk of bleeding uh, as you go higher up. You may not be able to get good hemostasis. So we're setting up the arm with the microcatheter. 
it goes in place, we flush it, make sure that um, there's no uh, obstruction to what we're injecting. And then Mike will hook it up, undo the clamp, and we'll do one final check with fluoroscopy to make sure that our microcatheter tip hasn't moved at all. Oh, I, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned also, we used a, a 200 centimeter 014 fathom that's also made by Boston Scientific. It's compatible with the direction microcatheter, but because of the delicate work that we were doing going distally uh, in the turns, as well as the length of it, 200 centimeters, it really helped with this case. Uh, it went very, very smoothly. I think, I'm sure you guys have mentioned in the other cases, if you, have, if you plan and have the right equipment, uh, it can uh, make a case go very, very smoothly. Certainly all, not all cases, but uh, if you can game plan ahead of time with the right equipment, I think it makes a big difference. And Mike uh, started injecting, uh, and we use a Rados meter to see the amount of radiation drop. And so the injection itself takes a couple seconds. Mike's already done injecting, uh, and then we do two flushes afterwards. Ed, are there any technical issues that you, you've come across with the actual infusion of the therosphere from a radio yeah. versus Yeah, so there, there are all the, if there are any issues, they're reported on, uh, through the NRC, and they're publicly available. For us, what we found, again, which we've, um, uh, I guess, made adjustments to our protocol, is we always flush beforehand, and, we, and the 2E is vital to doing radioembolization. Uh, you can get away with it doing chemoembolization, not having that TUI, but you want to lock your catheter in place. And so we lock it with a TUI in place, do the flush, and we always look at the tip of that microcatheter to make sure that it hasn't moved in position from our previous. So you can always inject to double check again, but we felt we haven't had the need because our results have been pretty consistent uh, in terms of where the injection is going. Well, in this case, we're doing a segmentectomy, so we're going selectively. It depends on the situation. And also on the disease state. I think with HCC, we tend to go more subselective with our injections. Now, we also have a very robust transplant program, and so we want to preserve as much liver parenchyma as possible while we're bridging transplants. We're region nine, and so the transplant wait list is minimum a year and a half, two years. Certainly in South Carolina, it's going to be much shorter, probably that minimum of six months that UNOS has mandated uh, starting October 2015. Right. The other thing is, you know, for instance, for lobectomies uh, in preparation for surgical resection, we'll also go subselective. But if you're dealing with a metastatic disease process where it's a, more of a diffuse uh, situation, we tend to go more proximal so that we can get um, a totality of, of the perfused segment. It, it really depends on the situation, but we go, we do, we utilize both. Okay, this, this is a great case. Uh, my, my quick question to you is, as an alternative to uh, segmentectomy, would you consider transradial taste followed by ablation on the same time? Single yeah, I think call? if the location is optimal, uh, uh, there's a lot of good evidence for uh, chemoembolization and ablation. Uh, in this situation, certainly that's an option. We just didn't like the proximity of the gallbladder and bowel, when you look at the reformatted cross-sectional images. And so we felt that because our experience has been very similar between the two to uh, uh, go ahead and do this. And our surgeons have really bought into this whole concept and have been driving our volume because when they explant these livers, consistently the pathologic necrosis has also correlated with the imaging response. Very yeah, ho hopefully we're gonna have some, some I mean, Obviously, you have this paper in radiology, which looks at this, that exact question, but I think in the next several years, we're going to have a lot more data on radiation segmentectomy, which uh, we consider the, the preferred modality, particularly in cases that don't have... Uh, yeah, and Sid, uh, if you look at JVIR, Sid Patty actually just published as well in uh, comparing radiation segmentectomy versus subselective chemoembolization. Ed, that was great. Um, thank you.